Well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, we live in a topsy-turvy world. If you, all you have to do is watch television, and you will see pictures of ideal families that include two daddies and two mummies. You'll go on to Facebook, and you will say, I'm going to bite the bullet. I'm going to get on Facebook so I can follow the, the pictures of the grandchildren or whatever. And you, they will ask you to choose your sex or choose your gender. And you'll think, all right, I'll click it, and it'll drop down. It'll be male and female. And male and female might be there, but there will be 73 other ones. Huh? Uh, you can choose your gender, and you can change it later. Many of us grew up thinking that gender was our plumbing, uh, but you're in today's world, you're sadly mistaken. This had manifests itself in many, many different ways. Uh, it manifests itself in what we see in critical race theory today. Maybe you've heard the words critical race theory, and this is infecting the church. And this is part of the social justice movement. So my, my, I'm just going to give a little intro here because it's a, big, it's a big subject. And so I've tried to pull this down to something that's bite size, you know, pull it down to something that's very practical. So we're going to be very practical today. Critical race theory, the LGBTQ and there's some more letters on there, but I haven't kept up with that. LGBTQ, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, the homosexual agenda. You can be who you want to be. Maybe you've seen the inter interviews on college campuses. And, you know, somebody that looks like me, and, and for those listening online, um, uh, I'm 194 centimeters long, or six foot four. I'm 275 pounds, and uh, you know I would be interviewing someone and say, I identify as a Chinese woman of five five, five foot five. <laughs> and the the person, the, this college person, would not dare to say, but that's ridiculous. You know, I can see the truth. The truth with my own eyes. You are not a Chinese, you're not Chinese, you're not a woman, and you're not five foot five. They don't say that. They say, well, you be you. Have you heard that before? You be you. Whatever you choose is what you are. Uh, and this has infected government. Uh, we see now all kinds of movements. Uh, in government, and if I think it's the I think it's the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, one one of those, which is a, a man in a dress, and of course I can get thrown in jail for that. I, I, I could get thrown in jail for the sermon I'm going to the talk I'm going to give today because it will be considered by some people to be hate speech, yeah. And hate means that you don't affirm everything I, I say, and love is affirming everything. So lots of, lots, of lots of different definitions. But underneath all of this is, is Marxism. Now, we don't teach Marxism to high school students. If you're a high school student, or you were, um, just looking at a few of you, you don't know what Marxism is. Marxism is what underlies, under, uh, was the underlying ideology of the Soviet Union. And in 1989, we're like, we won! And then it was like, yeah, so, so what? You know, uh, it's an evil ideology of pitting groups against each other. It's an evil uh, ideology that focused on equity, which is equal outcomes. And now here in the state of Indiana, you have equity initiatives in schools. Because it can't be that Carly comes out with a a grade point average that is twice what Peter Gillis comes out with. Yeah. Now, in this case, it, it could be because I'm a white male, and so that would be all right. But if I were a black female, or a gay black female, or a gay handicapped black female, then this would clearly need to be compensated for. 
And so now you have in California an initiative coming through for universal basic income. We have to level the playing field no matter what. For those of you who are philosophically uh, inclined, Karl Popper did a paper on this in the 1960s. What would a society look like you know, that was completely equitable? And what you found was is that you know, big, strong men would have to wear 100 kilo backpacks so that they weren't any faster than than another man or something. So, so you know, it, 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 it gets into ridiculous levels. Turn your, turn your brain off in a way, turn your logic off, because a lot of this isn't logical, unless you can get down to the Marxist underpinnings of envy between classes and this idea of equity. I think Marxists would say, well, we're against the rich, we're against the capitalists, we're against those people that take, take advantage of the poor. It's not so much that they are advocating for the poor. It's not that they're saying, like Paul, Peter and Paul did, you know, remember the poor, and both Peter and Paul said, yes, we should remember the poor. It's not that. It's, it's not love for the poor. It's hatred for those that have more. And I will show you three examples of this in our society today, but I hope I can focus most of what we talk about today. I'll just give you sort of a flavor. I'll give you a taster of some really weird stuff and then go into what do we need to teach our kids? Now, if your kids are five, this will be easier. And if they're above 50, this will be harder. But kids from five to 50 are are stepping into social justice because it sounds good, doesn't it? Justice? Who? I mean, so who's against just, justice? You know, I don't see any hands going up. You know, so there's a there's a there's an attractiveness to the name, but it's just a it's just a, a door to hell. I will try to show that a little bit, and show what I think may be the right Christian response to that. I've I've used many sources. John MacArthur in his Ezekiel series uh, on this. John MacArthur is a Calvinist, and he's uh, I, th- I think he does really good exegesis. Uh, Vody Baucom, a Baptist minister, I read his book on critical race theory called Fault Lines. I recommend it. Mike Winger, who's a real Berean, he's, he's not quite, he's not quite into right division, but he's a real Berean. Alyssa Childers, who has a YouTube channel, talks a lot about these things. And Elizabeth Urbanowitz, who from the Foundation Worldview Curriculum, and I steal directly from her work. And I don't think she would mind. So the title of my talk this morning is Social Justice. And it's just another manifestation of sin. So we don't have to worry too much. Here's the setup. I'll start with the problem. I'll talk a little bit about social justice. There will be three things. I'll talk about the destination of social justice if you're not careful. I'll talk about biblical victimhood, because victim, being a victim is really important here. And having, having suffered under social justice myself, um, it's easy, I can tell you, to feel like you're a victim. But God says you're not. Then there are five practical lessons that you need to make sure your kids have got under their wings. And I will end with the problem, and I will ask for any questions and I expect there will be uh, quite some questions because this is, this is a big subject. The problem with the world today. The Times of London sent out in the early 20th century, they sent out an inquiry to famous people and authors and that kind of thing. And the question was, what's wrong with the world today? And G.K. Chesterton, the famous Catholic apologist, whose books are brilliant, until you hit the, the Mary stuff, and then he kind of goes off the track, and, but he comes back, and then he's brilliant again. He, he wrote in. He responded to this. And to the question, what's wrong with the world today, he wrote, Dear Sir, I am. You and your sin. And so social justice is a, another manifestation of the world's sin. And your reaction to it can also be a manifestation of the world's sin. And I think we should be pretty uh, pr- pretty humble in this. You know, the social justice doesn't come from nowhere from complete idiots. 
they behave that way, they dump logic, they dump statistics, they dump all the things that we would think, well, that's how you make an argument. But there are people at Black Lives Matter that feel aggrieved. But it's a feeling. It's subjective. And they think that you should affirm that. And so, you know, be, there's one rule in, in a kind of therapy that I use when I do coaching, and it said if you, if you don't know what to do in a situation, you really don't know what to do, you're, you're confused, you don't know whether to lay down the law or give up or whatever, be kind. And I think that's, that's not bad advice. Marcus Aurelius said, I don't know why I remember this now, but Marcus Aurelius said the best way to... The best way to get revenge on your enemy is to not be like him. Now, if we were to talk about what's the problem with the world today, and you ask someone in the social justice movement, anyone in f feminism, postmodernism, Black Lives Matter, or the LGBTQ initiatives, that kind of thing, they would say, Peter, you are. I am white. I started to identify as dark white just to take a little of the edge off. I'm male, I'm heterosexual or cisgender, in, as the cool kids say. I'm conservative, Christian, educated, married with a wife that doesn't have a job. A wife that also uh, willingly submits to me in an Ephesians 5 way, although the other day, I, my third cup of coffee, she said, that's enough submission. And hopefully I submit to her as well that I love her. Ephesians 5, if, you focus, if you're focused on the world, the world will tell you how to love each other. But if you're focused on God, God will tell you how to love each other, and the bar is higher. Because I might not love my wife as Christ loved the church and I, I fail regularly. But I know what the bar is. I know where the tape is. I know where I'm running toward because of Christ. And I have children who are expected to obey and honor their parents. You see, that's, but that's the problem. And it comes from... I'll turn my arm around where it's... From that color skin. It comes from white skin. You say, Peter, I, I don't know, but is, isn't, isn't making decisions about people based on their skin color, isn't, isn't that racism? You will get thrown out of universities as a professor for suggesting that diversity and inclusion and that kind of thing are institutionalized racism. Yeah. So it's a new racism, but it's a racism against the right people this time. The problem with the world today. Let me tell you a little bit about feminism. I've researched this. It's in my book, Cultural Agility, which you can find on Amazon.com for a reasonable price. And I've researched this back to the, the Margaret Sanger. Some of you might know the name Margaret Sanger. She was a feminist and uh, pro-abortionist, pro-legal abortionist. She was for eugenics, uh, thought we should have fewer black babies, and she's accomplished that in, in New York City. There are more black babies aborted than born. So when Black Lives Matter says there's institutionalized racism, they have a point. They just don't point to the right place. Mallory Millett, who's a her sister, Kate, was a, a driver of this fem, fem, feminism. And, and by the way, from Margaret Sanger, it was anti-men. You said, no, 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 Peter, you don't understand. Feminism was just getting women the vote and making sure that women were treated equally just like men. Uh, no, that's the veneer. And, uh, I went back and I read Woman Rebel. Anyone here subscribe to Woman Rebel? And in there, the early 1907, it was saying, men, get rid of them. Patriarchy, get rid of it. Marriage, get rid of it. This is 1907. 1969. So we just put the first men on the moon. Mallory Millett went with her sister Kate. And Kate had invited her to join, to join a, a gathering at the home of a friend 
Lila Carp. They called the assemblage a consciousness-raising group, a typical communist exercise, something practiced in Maoist China. We gathered at a large table as the chairperson opened the meeting with a back-and-forth recitation, like a, like a litany, like you would see in the Catholic Church. But now it was Marxism, the church of the left, mimicking religious practice. Listen to this. Why are we here today? To make revolution. What kind of revolution? The cultural revolution. And how do we make cultural revolution? By destroying the American family. How do we make cultural revolution? By destroying the American family. How do we destroy the family? By destroying the American patriarch. And how do we destroy the American patriarch? By taking away his power. How do we do that? By destroying monogamy. How can we destroy monogamy? By promoting promiscuity, eroticism, prostitution, and homosexuality. Their answer left me dumbstruck, breathless, disbelieving my ears. Was I on planet Earth? Who were these people? They proceeded with a long discussion on how to advance these goals by establishing the National Organization of Women. Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter ostensibly started because people thought that young black men were being gunned down. So young black men, unarmed, police come out and think, young black men, I'll shoot him. Isn't it interesting that Black Lives Matter popped up in the last year, in the seventh year of our first black American president? After we had a black American president, we were divided on race more than ever. This is from Black Lives Matter. They scrubbed this from their website, but I found it on archive. There's an archive website that t takes these things. They've taken this down, but I have it. Every day, by the way, uh, these are not any of my words. I copied and pasted this, okay? So don't think I'm embellishing it. Every day we recommit to healing ourselves and to healing each other and to co-creating alongside comrades. Here's the Marxism again. Comrades, allies, and family, a culture where each person feels seen, heard, and supported unless you are a white male. So the inclusion that they talk about is exclusion. You say, but they, they keep redefining. Love is redefined. Tolerance is de redefined. Inclusion is redefined. Logic is redefined. Yes. We are unapologetically black in our positioning. What if we said on, on, on the Bible forum online, we put, we are unapologetically white in our positioning. How quickly would there be a SWAT team out front? You know? And rightfully so. But unapologetically black in our positioning? Vody Balcom says, the, the, the Baptist preacher I was talking about, he says, I got in, you know, I, I, I love the Lord, and I, I became a Christian, and man, I was fired up. And he said, and, and I left my football scholarship at Rice University, and I went to a seminary, and, and I got there, and I said, well, I, I got to find a church. And, and she, he said to the lady behind the desk, he said, I would like, you know, I, you know where are the black churches? And she didn't miss a beat. She pulled out her thing and said, oh, here are the black churches for the black man. He said, if I had been a white student and had said, where are the white churches? She would have looked at me as if I had fallen off a turnip truck. We are unapologetically black in our positioning. We are pro-LGBTQ+. What does that have to do with Black Lives Matter? It's because you get the whole package, folks. They're not separate. They're all one. We are pro-feminist. We are anti-men. We are anti-patriarchy. We are anti-men. We are anti-patriarchy. 
We are anti-nuclear family. Where have we heard that before? You get the whole thing. The church is eating this up. Evangelicals across the nation, 60% say, it's not right for me to push my beliefs on someone else. It's not right for me to share Christ with someone else. 60%, 6 zero, which is exactly the opposite, 40% of how many of those evangelicals believe that Jesus was God, which if you're a Christian is kind of the point. We are anti-nuclear family. Black lives matter and white male lives don't. It's racism, but it's the right sort of racism. And it's weird because they really focus, and you see these preachers on YouTube, and you see them on television, they're saying, we've got we've to get engaged with this. We've got we've to put our white guilt out there. We've, we've got to take the responsibility of the white guilt. We've got to listen. We've got to listen to people. If you, any of you have taken debate or logic, there's, a, there's an implied link there. The implied underlying link is White people have created this, and we need to get white people out there to uncreate it, to create something else. They're still pointing to the white people as the solution, even though they point to them now as the problem. Changing white people, white people then need to change how they think, and it's white people that will get us to this Black Lives Matter paradise. It's weird. But that's what's out there. The United States government. I, I shouldn't say the government. I think it's a semi-government institution. It's the Smithsonian Institute. Maybe you've heard of it. It's here. It's right here. I printed this thing out. I said, this is, you can find this on the internet. I am not making this stuff up. Smithsonian Institute has published a paper on white culture. White culture in the United States. You think, okay, white culture, black culture. There are different cultures. Oh, I, I could see that. White culture. Big up trucks. All right, all right, so okay, you're gonna say something in white culture. White dominant culture, dominant? Or whiteness. White culture or whiteness, that's your crime. White culture and whiteness has infiltrated this country. And here are the things that we, we need to get rid of whiteness. And what is whiteness? I'm gonna give you a definition. Whiteness is defined by Rugged individualism. Got to get rid of that. Who read the children's book when they were young? The Little Engine That Could. It was my favorite book. I think I can. I think I can. Little Engine. Think I can. I think I can. It's typically American. There's a new book out that says that the meritocracy, in other words, that you rise by merit. You do good stuff, and then you write. You go to school, and then you get a good job, and you do a good job at that good job, and you get more money, and you rise up, and you get to be the manager, or the, you, you write a, a meritocracy. The lie of the meritocracy is in that book. And now they have one where three little engines all help each other. And your kids and your grandkids are going to get that book. Rugged individualism, self-reliance, and you get what you deserve through what you put in. We need to get rid of. Family structure. The nuclear family, father, mother, and 2.3 children as the ideal social unit, should get, we should get rid of that. I'm not reading all of this. Emphasis on the scientific method. Objective, rational, linear thinking out. Cause and effect relationships, out. Quantitative analysis, out. The Smithsonian Institute. History based on the British Empire, Greek and Roman civilizations, and Judeo-Christian -Christi sources, out. Protestant work ethic, out. Religion, Christianity, out. Status, power, and authority, Heavy value placed on ownership of goods, space, and property. You got a factory? You think it's yours? You're wrong. It takes a village. Didn't you hear? Didn't you listen to Hillary Clinton? It takes a village, and the village owns your kids and your means of production. And this is what Marxism is: the state own, owns the means of production. 
future orientation out time like being on time out aesthetics and the way they put it women's beauty is based on blonde thin Barbie never with me but uh, man's attractiveness based on economic status power and intellect holidays are Christian holidays like Christmas and Easter out justice based on English common law property protection, entitlements like, oh, I don't know, trademarks, and intent, your intent in the crime counts. Competition is out. Be number one, make clear decisions, out. You can have it if you want it. That's out. That's whiteness, and we need to get rid of it. Who's the hero, according to the media at the Olympics in the last few days? Simona Biles, she may have troubles. I'm not saying that if you've got mental health issues, you shouldn't get help and that you shouldn't take care of yourself and make sure that you don't drown in your problems. I'm not talking about Simona Biles. I'm talking about the media frenzy. She is a hero, a heroine. (laughs) She is a heroine because she quit. But you can find a number of other athletes who couldn't contribute to their teams that were pilloried. Here's where I think it'll end up. I hope this scares you a little bit. Some of you may have friends that were in Eastern Europe, Communist Europe, even even the Soviet Union, I have. And they said, what we're seeing now in the United States and Western Europe is the same stuff that we saw from the government back then. Spent a lot of time in Poland. So I want to read you just the very first part of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's brilliant book, The Gulag Archipelago. Gulag is a concentration camp, and you were sent regularly to gulags, to concentration camps in Soviet Russia, because you would walk out that door, and there would be some men there, and they would just take you, and no one would be told why, and you wouldn't be told why, and you would be gone. And maybe if you were lucky, eight years later, you would reappear. So put yourself in the, you know, I don't want to bake a cake for a homosexual couple. Or um, uh, I want to talk about diversity in a university. Or I took down the Black Lives Matter and put All Lives Matter up. Arrest. Arrest. Need it be said that it is a breaking point in your life? A bolt of lightning which has scored a direct hit on you? That it is a spiritual earthquake not every person can cope with, as a result of which people often slip into insanity. The universe has many different centers, and as there are living beings in it, each one of us is the center of a universe. And that universe is shattered when they hiss at you, you are under arrest. If you are arrested, can anything else remain unshattered by this cataclysm? But the darkened mind is incapable of embracing these displacements in our universe. And both the most sophisticated and the most simple among us, drawing on all of life's experience, can gasp out only, Me? What for? And this is a question which, though repeated millions and millions of times before has yet to receive an answer. Arrest is instantaneous, shattering thrust, an expulsion, a somersault from one state to another. And that's all there is to it. You are arrested. And you'll find nothing better to respond with than a lamb-like bleat. Me? What for? That's what arrest is. It's a blinding flash and a blow which shifts the present instantly into the past and the impossible into omnipotent actuality. That's all. And neither for the first hour nor for the first day will you be able to grasp anything else except that in your desperation the fake circus moon will blink at you. It's a mistake. It's a mistake. Our Savior was arrested. 
without cause. He knew it was no mistake. Pilate said he wasn't guilty. His arrest was instigated by hubris and greed on the part of the Pharisees and Judas. You too might be arrested in some way. You might be kicked off Twitter for liking the wrong content or posting it. You may lose your job for saying that all lives matter. You may be removed from a university for facilitating a discussion on men and women in the workplace, something I call teaching while white. The axiomatic figure of the last 2,000 years is Christ, who suffered unjustly and promised his followers that they would too. They would suffer by following him. These ideologies only bring, so social justice ideologies, only bring that potential situation into sharper focus. Let me just, just one little thing here about, I, I was black, black, blacklisted out of a university after having been there 15 years, and I was always accused. I was brought in for meetings. I was brought in for meetings, and I wasn't told what the meeting was about. I was told there were documents submitted about me. I was never allowed to read them. I was told I was in trouble, but I wasn't told what the charges were. I was told by the complainant that I knew more about the subject than she did. But because of my skin color in front of a dean, because of my skin color and my sex and my conservative background, I should never be allowed to even teach the subject because of those things. If you don't think cancel culture is here, well, I hope I've disabused you of that. But we're not victims. Biblical victimhood. In the words of John MacArthur, in God's eyes, no one's a victim. I'm thinking, paddle your own canoe when I'm looking at you. Paddle your own canoe. We are all perpetrators of open rebellion, scandalous, blasphemous sin against God. Blaming others is the most natural thing to do. There's actual neuroscience that shows this. If you want to lower the stress in your life, find someone to blame. Think about that time you had a car accident. What was the first thought in your head? I hope I wasn't the one that ran that red light. I hope it was the other person. Yeah, Luckily it was. Someone's messed up my life. And we see this from, oh, I don't know, the beginning of the Bible. God says to Eve, what's going on here? And Eve says, that shiny snake tricked me. Adam, what's, what's, what's happening? Well, the woman that you gave to me, there are only two people on earth and they're both blaming someone. <laughs> Adam was blaming God. But you will be held accountable. Christian or social justice warrior. Not for what someone did to you, but for the sin in your own life. Today the church is embracing this victimhood. And this is a return to Adam. This is not in Christ. This is in Adam. We're returning to Adam. And to the, what the world says it needs. We need to be seeker sensitive. Have you heard that before? Seeker sensitive. Our church is seeker sensitive. How many churches did we drive past in Indianapolis just a few days ago that had a, that had a sign that said, all are welcome with a rainbow? Regardless of your sin, <laughs> who can say what's a sin? All are welcome. But we're not victims. So what can we do? Well, we can do a lot of things. I'm going to give you five short things that you can make sure that your children have a grasp of. And there's a chance that your children don't have it. And I don't care, again, if they're 5 or 55. The first one is the difference between objective truth and subjective truth or subjective preference. Do your kids know that? Do you know the difference between those two things? 
belief or feeling does not have reality making properties. Who's read the secret in here? If you think about it and you focus your whole life on money or the right husband, you'll get it. It's a law of attraction. It, d it doesn't work. The majority of evangelical Christians in the U.S. feel they should not evangel evangelize or, quote, push your faith on someone else. There is objective truth. I mean, we can go simple. We can say, like, gravity. Okay? And as Frank Turek says, he says, do people who don't believe in gravity float away? And so when we're looking for truth, we're looking at something that's true yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and for all people in all circumstances. This was, I'm, I'm using some of my words here that got me kicked out of university for talking about truth. For us, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I've told my kids, when you don't know what to do, <laughs> be kind, but when you don't know what to do, your touchstone is the Bible. What's in the Bible? We have a playbook. And it deals with exactly the same stuff. It's not old stuff. Well, Paul was back there. It was old. It's 2,000 years. No, it's, it's, it's very relevant to today. It's very... Jesus embodies wisdom. The things that you feel are not true are your perspective. Keep your perspective, but know it's your perspective, not the truth. That's the difference. Luckily for us, there is objective and compelling evidence for Christianity. One, uh, one person uh, online said, if creation is true and the resurrection is true, all of Christianity is true. Those two things. And we have abundant evidence for both. Please see my sermon on the five reasons to believe in the bodily resurrection from five, six years ago, seven years ago. Dairy me a long time ago. Anyway, it's, it's on the website. Teach the difference between objective and subjective truth, number one. Number two, don't follow your heart. But I have a passion to be a helicopter pilot. Well, you know, go, go off and do that. But don't follow your heart. We are told, and I teach this, I teach this, be authentic. What do people want? They want authenticity. Peter, Peter, will you come in and teach digital leadership, which between you and me is not different than the leadership stuff taught in the 1920s. Be the authentic you. I say, don't do that. Don't be yourself to my students. And could they look at me as if they'd been electrocuted? So don't be yourself. I said, if I was myself, I'd never get invited back to Thanksgiving dinner. Be your better self. You do you. Don't do you. The heart is an unreliable guide to truth. But we're in a subjective world. You see, remember the Smithsonian thing I shared with you? Remember the part about science taking out logical, rational, linear thought? What we've done is we've removed objective truth. Objective truth is not viable. Elect objective truth is no good anymore. So what does that do? Well, it leaves my subjective truth to battle with your subjective truth. And it's all subjective. Yeah, so now we're on a, well, an, a, in that way, an even playing field. It's everybody's perspective against everyone else's perspective. But it's not true. Don't follow your heart. Your heart is unreliable. That's number two. Number three, love is not simply affirming what others feel. Ravi Zacharias gave the, the, the example of, a, uh, of, of a, a woman and she had uh, lost her newborn child. He said, if you think this is the right time to go and talk with her about Christ, yeah, share the gospel with her, bring out Rome and say all things work together for the... It, 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 that's, no, you just empathize with them. You, know? you just level with them. And you can affirm how that person feels. It's not necessarily the truth, but in that moment, you don't whack somebody with a baseball bat of objective 
truth and theology. But love is not simply affirming what others feel. Sometimes, and that's why we read, I asked him to read Mark 10. The rich young ruler came up, and what, do you remember it said? It said, and Jesus loved him. And the next words are, and Jesus said, yeah, and you're a great guy. And you just need to do one thing. Just one thing you need to do. And Jesus knew he couldn't do it. And he wasn't about to do it. And that's a biblical example of tough love. Today we would say, oh, no, I mean, but he does it right. And you, you help him along. You take him and give him a, you know, give him a partial scholarship. And, you know, and, and, and he'll come along and then he'll, he'll blossom. And No. Brody Balcom says there's an 11th commandment. It's thou shalt be nice. And we don't believe the other ten. Love is not simply affirming what others feel. Love is standing on the truth of Scripture and applying it to yourself and others. Four. You are not the one you've been waiting for. Please remember that. It's a directly coming from the, the Disney movie Frozen 2. Yeah, Frozen 2 is out. Your kids will watch it. Your grandkids will watch it. And somewhere in there, the mother comes to the princess and she says, you are the one you've been waiting for. Now, I'm all for sort of the pick yourself up by your bootstraps and don't be a wimp and get out there and do your best. I, I, I'm, I'm all for that. <laughs> I'm white. Um, but... It's, it's so ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, it's so ridiculous to ascribe those things to the color of someone's skin. You are not the one you've been waiting for. You can determine part of your destiny, like Rudyard Kipling's If. I don't know how many of you as young people had to memorize or had to listen to Rudyard, Rudyard Kipling's If. The one about if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you. It's nice. And, 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 and I do like it. I've made a Christian version of it in the meantime. But uh, you're not enough. You have God-given value, though. You are of immense value because you have the imago Dei. You're made in the image of God. But we need to be rescued, and God has paid the price. You cannot pay the price. Two weeks ago, I think it was two weeks ago, we wrote, read from Job. God was saying to Job, if you can make the, bring the humble low, or sorry, bring the prideful low, then I will tell you that you can save yourself with your, with your right hand. You're not enough, Job. But one of the problems I see here also is the problem I see with many of the people I coach. If you hear from other people that your value comes from you, what if you don't find yourself valuable? And a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't think they're okay. So if you don't feel valuable, you might res start to rely on confidence makers. You might get in with a crowd. Goth used to be a thing, right? Dressing up like that. You might dress a certain way, use a certain makeup, music change your appearance, get into football and be a maniac, have a, some kind of niche identity like, oh, I don't know, LGBTQ, to give yourself that confidence maker because actually you don't feel like you're enough. And so that's also a way into this social justice nonsense. It's, it's virtue signaling. It's not virtue. It's virtue signaling. Paul says, I've learned to rejoice in my weakness and infirmity because through that, God is glorified. Your identity in Christ is what you have been waiting for, not you. Final point. A good God wouldn't judge. It used to be that John 3.16 was the verse out of the Bible that everybody knew. There's some wacky guy in a wig behind the goalpost holding up John 3.16. Everybody knew about John 3.16. But now it's what? Judge not, lest ye be judged. And boy, that one's trotted out pretty quickly. Not the, not the rest of the verse, <laughs> which explains what they're talking about, but that's the one that's trotted out most now. The lady that I, 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 mentioned, uh, that I mentioned before who has a program on this for, for kids, 
Her name is Elizabeth Urbanovitz. And she tells a story of, uh, she's a teacher, she's a third grade teacher. And she walked past a little girl and the little girl had written the letter J backwards. And she said to the little girl, you wrote the letter J backwards. And the little girl looked up at her and said, don't judge me. And she was so taken aback, she kind of giggled. She's like, what? <laughs> okay, all right, all right. So, using white objective reasoning, you see how weird this is? Using white reasoning, is there a right way, little girl, to make a J? Yes. Is there a wrong way to make a J? Yeah. Am I your teacher? Yes. Should teachers help you make the letters in the correct way? Yeah. So then I should judge your work. Well, if you put it that way. It's very interesting. If you come up to someone and say, you look particularly nice in that, in that sweater. No one says, don't you judge me. Yeah, it's only when you judge someone and they think they're you know, not measuring up to something. You should judge based on scripture. You should judge, and now we come back full circle to, on objective truth or subjective preference. Objective truth, subjective preference. Make sure your kids understand it. Don't follow your heart. Your heart is evil. And we see this, we see this also in behavioral economics things. So there's, a, there's a book out by Dan Airely, and, and, and he said, when, when I give people the, the opportunity to cheat in money games that I did, I did it with 36,000 people. He said, how, you know how many big cheaters I had of the 36,000 people? Twelve. And they stole something like $350 from him. But he, but he had 18,000 half little cheaters. And they stole $36,000 from him. He says, when humans, this is not, this is not religious, this is, this is just, this is just uh, research into human behavior. He says, if we, give, if we are given the chance, we can be quite bad. One of the most popular books right now in the Netherlands is titled, Most People Are Good. And you read it, and it's the most obnoxious, superficial nonsense. And people are just eating it up. It's a lie. So, subjective versus objective truth. Don't follow your heart. Love is not only affirming. Sometimes you need to do it, but it's not only affirming. If, you, if I say that I'm a five-foot-five five Chinese woman, you're not helping me by saying, you be you. Ben Shapiro, we, many of you have heard of, his uncle is a schizophrenic. He thinks the radio talks to him. It doesn't help his uncle for you to say, oh, what the, oh did the radio say that? Well, gosh, you know, you should write that down and get, make a book. And then, no, you're off your meds. It's helping him. It's not loving to let him go down the line of that delusion. You are not the one, and good gods do judge. Just one more little story to, to round this off. Back, back to the problem. Vody Balcom, that black Baptist preacher I was telling you about, tells a story, a humbling story. He said, I was just a new Christian. He was in seminary. Two men knocked on the door, and they wanted to talk about the Bible. Yes! Wow, this is great. I mean, somebody just shows up at your door and wants to talk about the Bible. Come on in. He said, it took me about five minutes to realize that they're on a different team. He went back to university, told his buddies about this. These guys were going to come back and talk to him. He told his buddies, and they, they said, describe these guys. Ah, oh, they're clearly Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah. He said, I spent the next three days in the library. I studied and studied. And I never studied that hard for a test, but I studied that hard for these guys. I was going to be ready for them. Three days in the library. And when they came back, I was happy to see them. In his words, I wore them out. <laughs> Intellectually, I beat them like a tied-up goat. It was awful. 
He said, I went back to school. I told the guys there, slapping high fives with me. One guy kind of stayed, uh, stayed a little bit quiet and stayed behind. When everybody was gone, he leaned over and he said, you feel pretty good about that? I said, yeah. He said, do you think they're coming back? No, they ain't coming back. Then my eyes caught his. And he didn't have to say another word. He just turned and walked away. I was trying to win an argument, not a soul. I was trying to feel good about my ability to use and manipulate information in a manner that was superior to my opponent. And I'm ashamed of that. So, even in the face of something that looks so illogical, you've got people. And we are out there to represent Christ. And we are out there to share the gospel. And even though it's easy to win, yeah, and this is a problem that I had at the university, I was so aghast. I was so taken aback by the stupidity of diversity, inclusion, equity, social justice, that I said it in those words to people who had bought into it. Did the university treat me right? Probably not. Did I create some of my own problem? You bet. Yeah, the problem is our hearts. And only Christ can solve these issues. Only Christ can solve the, the, the turmoil that you have in your heart. And then, you know, how are you going to tell that to your kids? How are you going to tell it to your grandkids when they come home and say, oh, I'm white and I'm bad? Because of your skin color? Yeah, but, you know, don't try to use all that white logic because my teacher says it's not right. And what is your response going to be as a Christian, not as a white person? Your Lord, your Lord stood there and didn't say anything at, at, uh, to his accusers. Yeah. Paul said, if you're in this, you will be persecuted. And this sermon here could easily be used against me when I apply to the next university apply for a job. The things I've said here are considered by, I would even say maybe most people, to be absolute hate speech. So that's where we are. And that's what the church is absorbing. And it's not Christian. We, we think it's love because we want to be loving because we're Christians. And loving means affirming other people. No, it doesn't. Loving means this is what it means to be a Christian. And if you want to come to church and live your homosexual lifestyle, active homosexual lifestyle, I mean, bring all the homosexuals to the church. That's great. Homosexuality is just a sin. Just like the ones you've got. It's acting on it. It's practicing it. That's the, the problem. And that's what we're allowing because, you know, that's seeker sensitive and that's... And so it's it's ripping the church to pieces, especially the Anglican Church and the Episcopal Church. Numbers are going down like this because they're getting the more liberal they get, the more progressive, the more social justice minded they get, the fewer people are going to church. Well, we'll uh, we'll close and pray. Father, help us and guide us in our fear. Help us and guide us in our pride in our need to show that we are right and they are wrong. Help us channel that into a need to do your will. Truth is found in your Christ. He is truth. It is found in your word. So let us be in the world without being of it. Help us to raise our children to the, in the truth to speak that truth to each other and to use your truth to reason with those who would oppose what is right and good and ordained by you. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.